And you may be seated, and as you do, um, we are in for a treat. Uh, I am so blessed, and Cynthia and I are so blessed that um, we have people who have come up uh, through the ministry here at this church, and, and Richie uh, and uh, his wife Amy have uh, come up through the youth ministry here at this church, and it is, man, it's a feather in somebody's cap. Uh, Randy, who was my colleague here and the uh, youth leader for so many years, deserves a lot of credit. Their parents deserve a lot of credit, and I'll take a little bit for myself, <laughs> that now he's going to address these young people in our church. Uh, because God has poured into this young man, and I am so very proud of him. So bless Richie as he right. comes. Thanks, Victor. Appreciate it. So I do announcements fairly regularly, and I mess that up quite often, so don't expect anything different uh, as I talk today. So, um, no, I am very excited about the opportunity to talk to you guys and the rest of the congregation as well. Um, the last time I gave a speech was like 2001. Um, I think the two salutatorians, they talked for forever, and I had like five paragraphs, and it was, it was done, and I messed it all up. So you should take two things from that. One, I am inexperienced, and two, this could be really brief, so you guys might get out early. Um, those of you that know me better know that I do have a tendency to go on and on, though, so I don't count on this being too quick. Um, as I mentioned, in your gifts, you do need your gifts, so in your gifts, go ahead and take that out right now. Actually, not the whole thing, because there's other, go ahead and grab them. Um, sorry. There, there is a journal and a pen in there that I want, I want you to grab because um, I'm going to give you a chance to practice your, you know, going to school, attending classes opportunity here. The reason is because I have a lot to say and a lot of really big ideas, um, none of which I can cover fully in the time I've been given. And much like in your college lectures where you're there for 45 minutes, three days a week, you have to learn a lot of this stuff on your own. So you're going to have to go home and kind of think about all this stuff and understand it for yourselves later. So... Um, so get those out and get ready, and I'll tell you what you, what you have to write down, but um, yeah, you don't have to write just this second. Well, maybe you do. Uh, well, maybe you do. Hold on. Okay, so yeah, you're ready, and that's what I appreciate. So, okay, um, let me pray, and then we'll go ahead and jump into this. God, thank you so much for your goodness toward us. I thank you for um, being in control and for loving us so much. I pray for the graduates uh, as they move on to a new part of their life. I pray that you'd be with them. I pray that as they do that, that they would keep you in, in front of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So much of life, I think, comes down to whether or not you're going to believe that God is telling the truth. Um, and that's a, it's a really simple idea, but it really is uh, that simple. I mean, if we believe God, then, then we're, we're set. Now, the unfortunate thing is that the, the devil exists, and, and he basically speaks lies. In John 8, 44, and um, bear with me, I'm, I'm going to try something that we haven't done yet, and that involves me uh, controlling the, the, the monitor, so if things go wrong, I apologize, um, but it'll be fun, it'll be good. So in John eight forty four, uh, Jesus is talking about um, the devil, he says, and here he says, you are of your father the devil, and you will do uh, your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. So I bring this up because we need to recognize that much of what we experience in life could be a lie from the devil. We need to understand and be able to discern the difference between those things. So um, today I'm going to kind of cover what I think are some really important truths that you guys are going to need to know uh, as you're introduced to a whole lot of new ideas that maybe you haven't yet before. Um, but before I go too much further, I do want to share with you a few resources, and you're going to want to write these ones down. So the first one I'm going to share with you is, uh, it's called the Gospel Coalition. There's a website, thegospelcoalition.org. Um, this is a fantastic resource. More, It's for everyone, really. It's not just for the graduates. Um, you know, you can see this is a live, this is what's up on their webpage right now. But this is a great resource for articles about current day issues, how the gospel has a, a practical impact on how we should kind of view them. So thegospelcoalition.org, write that one down. Um, a similar site is called uh, desiringgod.org. Um, jo John Piper is the one kind of behind this. Uh, and I just want to make, make you aware of these sites because there's, like I said, tons of great resources, great information, articles that can really help you understand, well, how are we supposed to respond to that? What does God have to say about this or that? And, and this is a great place to look. Um, as you move, you know, to wherever you're moving to, where your college is, you may need help finding a church. Um, Acts 29, thegospelcoalition.org helps you. There's a church uh, lookup thing option there. You can check that out. Um, Acts 29 is another one. If you guys know uh, the Bible at all, Acts tw 29, 
the chapter 29 in Acts doesn't exist. Um, and it's intentional because the idea is that we have continued the church and thus um, have written the next chapter, if you will, of, of what Acts has done. So anyway, Acts 29 is a church uh, network as well, and you can use that to find churches. So when you, while you're at college, if you can't find one or need help finding one, or wherever you end up when you graduate, uh, remember that. And then the last one I'll mention is thevillagechurch.net. Um, I, I only mention that one primarily because, not because I want you to go attend a church in Texas, but because that, that site does a great job in producing resources for the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole church. In fact, I think this summer they produced like a family devotional with a lot of activities that you can go do as a family and talk about them afterwards. So, so those are just four resources I want you to be aware of, um, you guys in particular, but everyone in whole, in, the, in general, um, because I, I found a lot of value in re- reviewing those. And as we're bombarded with so many lies, it's helpful to see uh, where the truth, obviously, um, you know, the Bible is kind of the first place to look, but as it is, that's, that's, those are good resources. So um, I was reading uh, an article the other day on The Economist. Actually, if you guys, I don't know if you're familiar with The Economist. It's a very popular magazine throughout the world. Um, I don't know any of its political affili- affiliation, so if, I'm, if you guys are angry about that, I'm sorry. But um, it was an interesting article, and the topic of the article was about how this generation, the teenagers of, of current day, are apparently increasingly narcissistic. In fact, um, they reported, yeah, it, it, isn't that crazy? Well, it's maybe not a surprise the other way. According to the article, I, it said 93% of young Americans emerge as being more narcissistic than the average of 20 years ago. So um, I don't know exactly what this means. I don't know if this means that everybody like, has better self-esteem or something. I, I don't want to draw any of those conclusions. But I am going to say um, that I, it helps me draw the point that we get the very first truth that we need to understand completely mixed up. And that first truth is that God is the point. So you can write that one down. So God is the point. And this by itself, if you got this right, then everything else falls into place. Um, So so let me read a few verses for you. In uh, Isaiah 43, uh, verses 6 and 7, um, it says, I will say to the north, I can't read that far, sorry, um, Give up, and to the south do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We were created for God's glory. If we get, if we get this point wrong, then we're going to mess everything up in life. In fact, we're going to talk about how that happens later on. I'm going to read another passage or another verse out of Romans. This one probably rubs a lot of people the wrong way when they see it. Um, and I want it to because it will make my point more clear. Uh, in Romans 9, Paul is talking to the Romans, and he's explaining a situation. Uh, uh, he's basically interpreting what happened in, in uh, Exodus and dealing with the Pharaoh. And he says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Doesn't, doesn't sound very positive, and I think that's because, and we'll talk about this later, we have got something mixed up in the core of us that makes us uh, not like reading something like that. In Romans 11, uh, verse 36, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So, God is the point, and we need to remember that all, that all that exists is for His glory. All that we are, all that we do is for His glory. All the things that we just talked about should be for His glory, um, and so we need to remember that. Now, I don't want, you know, you guys to get all angry, so why is God, you know, so much about Himself? It seems wrong that He's all about Himself. Um, well, let's understand who we're dealing with, okay? We're dealing with the God of the universe. In Psalm 145, verse 3, it says, Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised, his greatness is unsearchable. And in Psalm 145, a little bit further down, 7 and 8, it says, uh, They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So we, we kind of don't like the idea of us not being the center of the universe, right? It just doesn't seem right. It, it doesn't feel as though we should be okay with God being about himself, um, but the fact is, he is, and that's what matters. In fact, he is worthy of it. So let me actually put up, I, I put up another verse, and, I mean another slide here, uh, and I only put it up because I wanted to say one word on it. Um, but let's review some of the character traits of God. God is good. 
So, so yeah, it's, he's all about himself, but it's because he's good. Um, he's loving. He's just. And this idea, see, this is the problem with me not having enough time. Like, these are huge ideas. The idea of justice comes from God. And so our understanding of justice in this, in this society is only based on, on God's understanding of justice, what it means. It explains why Jesus had to die for us. That's what justice uh, means. He's immutable. And that's the word I wanted to say. I really, it's the only reason why I put the slide up. is because I wanted to say immutable, um, which means that he is unchanging, right? So uh, this, is, this is a critical aspect of God. He does not change. He, his character is the same um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And it's all of these things. Holy, he's merciful, he's powerful, he's majestic, he's eternal. And this list could go on and on. So the point I'm trying to get you guys to understand is that if God is the point, um, he's worthy of being the point. And he is all of these things. Our understanding of what goodness is only comes because we understand that God exists. Um, The the problem with with not understanding that God is the center of the universe and that God is the point is that we lose sight of what good is. We lose sight of what justice is. We lose sight of holiness. Um... So as I said, you need to remember that point, um, first and foremost. The rest of this kind of hangs on that. Um, so I wanted to cover a couple other things. Actually, before I go any further, uh, and I meant to say this a second ago, so I, it's out of order. I didn't look at my notes soon enough. Um, you hear me say fairly often that the gospel is the answer to every question you will ever have. And, and that sounds very vague and kind of squishy or whatever. Um, but I feel so strongly that the proper understanding of the gospel is the only thing that's going to have a, a true and lasting impact on your life. Um, and so the first aspect of the gospel is really understanding who God is. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to kind of start there, and then as we go forward, you'll see how these things kind of make sense. Um, so we've talked about God. Uh, there are a couple other things I want to talk about. One is man, and the other is Jesus, and then we'll talk about our response. So man, um, there's two things I want to show uh, or point out about man. Uh, the first is that we are, man is created in the image of God. Uh, this is an enormous theological idea as well, and again, I won't have time to do it full justice. Again, the, the website I showed you before has lots of great articles about these kinds of things. Um, so created in the image of God, and two, we're fallen. Uh, fallen, and that's an enormously significant issue as well. Uh, I bring up these things because I believe these things are being bombarded in our society today. These kinds of truths are being bombarded today. And really, I say today, I mean, this has been going on for since Adam and Eve sinned, so it's not like this is any different per se. But uh, let, let's start in Genesis 1.27 and talk about this idea of being created in his image. Um, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Um, so there's actually, again, a lot in this verse. Us being created in God's image is critical. Uh, the other thing I will very briefly touch on is that God gave us a job to do, and you can see that there, that, that we have work to do, and I think that's important to remember. We won't talk, talk about how important that is right now. But, um, so why is, it, why is it significant that we were created in the image of God? Um, well, let me, let me bring out a few points. The first is that we're unique in all of God's creation. Uh, what it, I mean, what does it mean to be created in God's image is that we have a unique capacity to, to relate to God. He loves us uniquely above the rest of creation. Um, and that's huge. It means that we're not just simply walking this earth like all the other animals are. Um, God loves us. And so th- there's an enormous significance to that and that, that it, it can affect how you see things. It, the image of God issue kind of comes up in a number of ways. I, I do want to read one more verse in uh, Psalm 139 real quick. Oops, wrong verse. Yeah, okay, it says, for you formed my inward parts. You guys are very familiar with this verse. It probably pops up all the time uh, in a lot of, like, mugs and T-shirts or whatever. Maybe not T-shirts, but um, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Okay, so you guys have been made specifically by God. You've been designed by God. Uh, you're created in his image. Um, and I think about this, like, you know, if I were to play against LeBron James in, in, uh, in basketball, right, the guy is gigantic. He's like, what is he, like 260, 6'5", something. I mean, he, the guy, he, what is he? 6'9", 6'8"? 6'8", okay. Yeah, he's just, whatever. So, okay, he, here's the thing. Like, I'm playing, I'm playing, if I were to play basketball, one-on-one basketball with LeBron, LeBron James, um, it does not end well for me, right? I, I, uh, I'm barely 5'9". Uh, maybe, yeah, I think I'm about 5'9". Um, 
I, I, he, would, he would swat the ball away. It would be awful. Um, and if I were to base my entire identity on whether or not I could beat LeBron James in basketball, then I'd be a, a mess. I'd be a wreck. And I think too often what happens is we, we base our identities on a lot of these things that God has given us, that, um, and we start comparing with other people. So if I, were to, if I were to play basketball against LeBron James and define myself by what he did, um, LeBron James is essentially defining that I'm a horrible human being. I'm, I'm a horrible individual because I can't play basketball. And I think what we as Christians, or what we as humans tend to do is start, uh, you know, putting our emphasis or identity in, in our accomplishments. And so I don't want to, I don't want to downplay all the things that we just read. But if those become how you're defined, then you're never going to get things right. And I talk about, you know, you as high schoolers, uh, you know, you've accomplished all of those things, National Honor Society, Honor Roll, all of those things. Um, and we kind of focus on that. But this is something that occurs throughout the, the rest of the world when you're done. People... People put their identity in their, their position, their title, right? You know, I'm, I'm X rank, or, or they put their, their, title or their identity in, in their salary, right? Like how much money they make. They put um, their identity in their appearance. Uh, and this is a huge one, I think. Um, it's, it's, so, it's so unfortunate that people start defining, letting other people say that their value is dependent on how they look when that is something that God gave them and that is an opportunity for you to, um, to use and worship him. Because if you remember the very first point, the point is to, about God, to worship him. So the first thing we need to recognize about man is that we are created in his image, which means we are unique. We're set apart from uh, all of creation. We have a unique capacity to relate to God um, and that our identity should only be found in him. If we let other people start defining us, then, uh, then we're losing an opportunity to worship God through the things that he has given us. Um, so that's important uh, to remember. Second key point is uh, about man is to, that we are fallen. And, uh, you know, I'm realizing I do need some water. This is, this is I'm, I'm glad this worked out, that you have water for me. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what, I normally talk all the time, and I don't have a problem. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. So we are fallen. Um, this, is, this is also significant. So our fallenness is, is total and co- complete. So in Romans 5.12, there's, again, a number of verses we could cover. I, I picked this one to point out that, um, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Um, so, so getting the understanding of sin right is extremely important as well. Um, because where I think uh, Christians tend to go wrong is when we think about sin, uh, the individual results of sin. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Uh, have you guys ever seen an apple tree? Okay, so you know it's an apple tree because it's apples, right? You wouldn't call an apple tree an orange tree if it had apples growing from it, right? Okay, I mean, it makes sense, right? You see, okay. So if, if, we, were to, as, if we were to go pick up all the apples and take all the apples away, would you have an orange tree or an apple tree? You'd still have an apple tree. Uh, did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought I switched trees on me because I think I was using orange when I was practicing. So anyway, the, the, the point is that um, we, as, uh, we need to understand, have a proper understanding of what happens with sin. So in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we kind of read the story of, of how things kind of fell apart on us. Genesis 3, 4, and 5, uh, Adam and Eve are, are hanging out in the garden. And it says, but the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So that like God concept, I think, is really where uh, it, it kind of is where everything went wrong. Adam and Eve had decided that rather than keeping God at the center of the universe, God being the point, they put themselves in that point. And so let's go back to the tree concept. So if we ever, as Christians, don't recognize that we, at, at that source, are completely corrupted, um, then all we're going to do is focus on picking up all these apples without ever dealing with the tree that is the wrong tree. You see what I'm saying there? The idea is that our corruption is so complete um, that everything we do uh, that, that is wrong flows from that core problem that we messed up or that we've gotten wrong from the beginning. So you read in... Uh, in like later in the, in the New Testament talks about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith control, faithfulness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Um, 
the point there in that case is that those who have been redeemed uh, are going to ex- exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. In other p- places in the Scripture, you hear Paul talk about all the things you need to get rid of, like malice, rage, anger, sexual immorality. Again, all of those things are essentially the fruit of a sinful nature that need to be corrected at the root, not uh, at the behavior problem going forward. So, so this is, uh, I, I think, one of the most important things that we as Christians kind of get wrong. We get the understanding of sin wrong. We, get the, we don't realize that sin is corruption of our nature and that everything that we do that is wrong is a flowing out of that. And we don't realize that essentially what we've done is we've replaced God with ourselves, the center of the universe. And I think you can understand how that messes things up, right? I mean, if, if God is not the center of the universe and you are, uh, then you know, I might not want to take care of my baby girl when I, I'd might rather just take a nap or something and make my wife deal with it. You see, if I'm putting myself at the center of the universe, I'm not choosing to worship God and, and understand that he loves me and so therefore love my wife in that way. So uh, getting sin right and understanding our, the situation that man is in is critical. Man being created in God's image and that we are fallen. Those are truths you have to recognize. Um, being created in his image, as you know, uh, means that we are unique in creation. So let's spend some time talking about Jesus now. Um, I'm realizing now it's like, 10 or 12.50, I might be done sooner than I thought I was, so you guys actually might get out of here on time, um, which is a good thing. So let's talk about Jesus really quickly. Uh, these are the truths you need to recognize. One, that Jesus is God. A lot of, every other religion that does not recognize that God, that Jesus is God, gets it wrong. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we know this. Jesus is fact. And I, I like this, this point because you're going to have to be faced with the fact that Jesus existed and that he said the things that he did. And when you understand that, that he's fact, then, then you can, you, you're going to have to be, come to grips with the fact that he said he was God. And there's no getting around that. So regardless of how confused you may get in a couple of years from now with people kind of talking to you crazy, you have to deal with the fact of Jesus. You can't talk him out of that. I mean, and we'll talk about more about how I know that in a second, so I shouldn't get ahead of myself. Um, the third is that he came to give us an abundant life. I think too often Christianity comes with the message of, uh, or churches are like, hey, you need to behave. You know, this, you need to get everything right. You need to work. And, and it comes across very negatively. It comes across, oh, well, I have to do all these things to earn God's favor. But the fact is God gave us, came to give us an abundant life, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, he paid our penalty. Um, so let's, let's go to the Jesus is God part first. Because um, I want to spend some time on this because this is one of the things people try to explain that the Bible doesn't say that Jesus is God or that he didn't say he was God. Um, I, we need to refute some of those things for you right now so that you can remember this. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word here is Jesus, and there's no denying that that's the intent of the uh, author's uh, writing here. And he basically said that Jesus was God. Okay, there's no, there's no getting around that. It says that plainly. In John 18, verse 6, I don't, you guys probably remember this, this scenario too, um, yeah, I, this is one of the coolest instances or uh, stories in the Bible. So, you know, Jesus is about to die. He's hanging out in the, Geth, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, Gethsemane. Um, he's hanging out with his guys, and, and this, like, mob of people come up to him, right? I, I, this is unfortunate, but I always think of the Beauty and the Beast where they're, like, with the... Y'all, that's probably too old for you guys, isn't it? <laughs> You've seen that, right? Okay. You know, the, but you remember what the pitchforks, they're trying to kill the beast or whatever. So this is, this is unfortunate. I shouldn't trivialize such an important event in history. But, I mean, th- this group of men is coming up to take, care, to, to take Jesus away and eventually uh, murder him and kill him. And so, they, you know, they're trying to figure out who he is. And they go up to Jesus and they say, you know, are you the one we're after? And he says, I am. And they all drew back and fell down. Now, that I am phrase should be significant because when God uh, was talking to Moses and Moses asked him, what am I going to call you? What am I going to tell you? He said that you should, I am. He said, I am. And that's unmistakable that Jesus was using that phrase to, to claim deity, to claim that he was God. And so um, when people say, oh, well, Jesus didn't actually claim to be God, he absolutely did. Um, and it's clear that in the scriptures, Jesus made those statements more than once. And I, this is just one simple example. There are a number of others throughout the Bible, in which, uh, specifically the Gospels, in which Jesus um, states that he is God. Um, it's significant, it's huge. And then finally, in, in Hebrews, uh, we've been reading through Hebrews recently, and this is kind of cool. So the writer of Hebrews is interpreting some of the Old Testament for us, and it's really pretty awesome. So in this case, it's, uh, 
David. David's writing in the Psalms, and, and he says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness upon your, beyond your companions. Okay, so the reason why this is kind of interesting, you, you catch this, right? So the phrase, it says, your throne, O God, speaking to Jesus. So if, if God is talking to Jesus saying that your throne, O God, uh, is forever and ever, then God himself is acknowledging that Jesus is God. So this is huge. The Bible makes very clear that Jesus is God, and this is something that, unfortunately, other religions get completely wrong, and people don't see, a lot of scholars will say, well, it's not clear that that's the case. No, it is, and you can't get around that. So if Jesus claimed to be God, um, then, uh, and he's supported by others, then there's no denying that the scriptures kind of talk to that. Um, okay, so that's the first point about Jesus that I wanted to make, was that Jesus is God. The second is that it is fact. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, and you want to write these verses down here too, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 8. This is one of the most uh, clear and articulate, exp- articulate? Yeah, explanations of the gospel that, that you can find. Um, it's fairly simple. So this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. And he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is it. You've got to listen here. It's pretty straightforward. You've heard all this before, but it's pretty straightforward. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he, also, he appeared also to me. Um, so when I say that Jesus is fact, let me explain why I mean that. So Jesus rose again and then appeared to 500 brothers, most of whom were, were alive at the time. So the people that were receiving this letter could have gone up to the guy, one of those 500, and said, hey, did you see Jesus? Yeah. So the, the, this is kind of, in Paul's terms, I mean, this is a Statement of fact. There's no question about Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. The fact that he fully, he completely died, that he was buried, and that he completely rose again bodily. This is, this is a huge thing to recognize that this is a fact you cannot get away from. So regardless of how confused you, you get down the road, you're going to have to deal with this. This happened. If this happened, what does that mean? It means everything that we talked about before, about God being the point, about Jesus being God, and about him paying our penalty. We'll talk about that in a minute. Oops. Don't go to, don't look at that verse yet. Okay. Um. So I wanted to mention, so this is the Bible, and people will say, okay, well, where, where does Jesus exist outside of the Bible? I'll mention um, two other sources. One of them is Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, and at least two of, well, I, I don't know how many volumes specifically, but uh, he, he actually wrote of Jesus' life and, and uh, his crucifixion as well. So there is some external evidence of, of Jesus' existence in Jewish history, um, but also in Roman history, there's a guy named uh, Okay, really quickly. In Latin, a C is a hard C, right? It's like, so if I were to say Tacitus, even though it's a T-A-C-I-T-U-S, it's Tacitus, right? Does anybody know Latin? No? Okay. Sorry. Yeah? Is that right? Okay. So anyway, Tacitus is a Roman guy. He, he wrote about Jesus' uh, crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Um, you're not going to see it up on this. I'm not sure why I'm pointing at slides, but... Uh, so, so here's, here's my point. We've got in biblical evidence the fact that Jesus was alive. He was seen by 500 people. People could go verify that, his, that he was alive. Um, we've also got historical records out, out, outside of the Bible that confirm that Jesus existed, lived, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So he's a fact. No getting around that. So it's an important truth. And I say these things kind of come across as really simplistic, and they very much are, but they're critical because they're under fire uh, in, a, in a number of ways. Um, okay, so the next verse I wanted to cover is the one that I went to, John 10. John 10, 10. Uh, as, I, as I said before, I think oftentimes people come to church and expect to hear somebody saying, hey, make sure you're good all the time. Make sure you're good. Um, and it comes across as like, oh, I have all these rules I need to. Um, it didn't change. Sorry, I think I may have lost my connection. There we go. Uh, you come to church thinking, oh, I got all these rules I have to follow now. Life's going to be so frustrating and boring. I'm going to hate it. 
things. I can't have fun. I mean, that's the impression I think a lot of people, particularly younger folks, get about, well, not even just younger folks. I think people in general feel as though, you know, Christianity is all about all these rules. And the fact is it's not. I mean, it, it's about giving us an abundant life, the life we were meant to have. Jesus came. Uh, the, the thief comes to only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So, and we'll talk about this. Uh, there's a lot, again, a lot more I could say about this. But the point is that Jesus did not come to make your life miserable. God came because he wanted to give us life. The one who wants to make us miserable is the one that came to kill, steal, and, uh, steal and destroy. Right? That's the one that wants to make our lives miserable. And yet, we are so easily deceived by the things that he says that, that you know, we're kind of walking into that. And it's really unfortunate that that's the case. Um, so, uh, the truth is that God came to give us life. And so, when we honor and understand who God is, choose to love and obey him, then we're going to have the life, an abundant life. And now, when I say abundant life, don't hear me saying um, that you're going to be sitting in a mansion. You know what I think of? Um, do you, you don't anything about ducktails, do you? It's horrible references. I'm sorry. It's, it's really sad that the things that I, I don't know, whatever. DuckTales, the opening sequence was always great. It had the, um, the who's the dad duck? I don't remember his name. I don't think it was Donald. Was, was it, Sco huh? Scrooge? Scrooge McDuck, that's right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the opening sequence, it's him jumping off a diving board into this pool of like gold coins. He's swimming around in money. That's not the abundant life I'm talking about. And, and you need to understand this because the abundant life could very well, well involve you getting, um, your skin burned off of you. You know what I'm saying? Like, that doesn't sound great, but the abundant life is going to come because we're going to be giving God glory and that uh, we're going to understand why God is giving us the things that he is. The abundant life is not so that you can be happy and never be sick. and that it's, it's so that you can, you can understand that God is worthy of worship. Right? So, truth, uh, that was the truth, the third truth about Jesus being um, that he came to give us an abundant life. Uh, the fourth truth about Jesus that I would mention is that he paid our penalty. This is incredibly significant, so don't, don't miss this. In 1 Peter, it talks about he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. In Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, it also says, um, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So I talked about before how we have, as, as man, we are fallen. We have this sin nature that has totally corrupted us. That everything that we do uh, that, is, that is wrong is a source from that, that, that corruption that exists. But this is telling us that Jesus paid the penalty that, that we deserve because of that corruption. Jesus has taken that uh, that punishment. So I talked about how God being the point, how he is just, um, how he requires a payment for uh, that corruption. Well, Jesus paid it for us. It's not because of anything we've done, but because he loves us. That's huge. It's by his grace that he chose to do that and, and to save us from that sin. So the, the importance of this is that because of our corruption, we deserve uh, punishment. We deserve death. Jesus took that punishment, and because of God is just, exacted his wrath on Jesus. Um, and more than that, Jesus imparted his righteousness to us so that we are completely right before God. And, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's just, that's such good stuff, guys. Like, God's graciousness towards us, God is gracious, compassionate, slow anger, rich in love. I mean, if you don't, if you don't realize that God is worthy of praise because of what he's done in that act of love, uh, there's not much I can do for you. Um... Yeah. So here's the thing. How do we respond to all of these truths? I told you before, like, you know, we're too easily believing the lies uh, of the world. And, and I think th that our response to, this is to, response to this needs to be that we believe him and experience God's grace. We need to believe that he's telling the truth. Um, I think once you understand that he's telling the truth and when you fully experience his grace, then everything you do should be for his glory and 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Um, God's grace is so big. Um, I think too often Christians do you know, two things. One, they'll probably think that their sins are too bad, uh, that God can't cover them. We, we kind of, and that's actually a, a, an act of self-righteousness in and of itself, to believe that God is not capable of wiping out your worst sin. I mean, how prideful is that? God loves you. 
God uh, has grace for you, and he wants you to experience that and to, to love him in return. Um, I think the other thing we try to do is think that, and I think this is particularly an issue for Christians, uh, we somehow start believing that God owes us our salvation. We start thinking, oh, well, I did all the right things, right? I did all the, you know, I went to Sunday school all the time. You, know, you guys come to church every Sunday. You don't, you're not earning God's favor. You're not coming, you shouldn't be coming because, you know, you think that by doing that, you, God owes you something, right? You're not doing that because he's going to give you anything for it. You're doing it because you have an opportunity to worship and glorify God. And so if we ever get that mixed up, then we're, we're in trouble. So um, the point is that God, when we experience God's grace completely, it is going to completely transform your life. Um, you can't help but then worship uh, because of it. So here's a practical example of how this may work, all of these things. So knowing that I'm a, a sinful human being, fallen, but I'm created in God's image, uh, somebody that he loves, uh, knowing that God is just, knowing that he is gracious, uh, full of grace, knowing that Jesus came and died for me, means that I do everything for him. You're going to get jobs later on. You might, you might end up, I don't know, I don't know where you're going to end up. Maybe one of you is going to end up being a doctor, maybe. Maybe Tony. Maybe, maybe you're going to end up being a doctor one day, and uh, you're going to have to work hard. Uh, and you're actually going to have some very tangible uh, potential issues where if people are depending on you to maybe cut their chest open, rip out their heart, and put a new one in. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But you need to do that not only to save that person's life potentially, but for his glory. And the fact that you're um, able to is a testament to God's grace. We can only, I think, operate in a society like this when people recognize that there's a higher power that's kind of over, overseeing all of it, that we are ultimately working for him. Now, I talked about the doctor situation. That's kind of really, a lot of people consider in society consider that really noble and, and, and unique. Um, but it's no more or less significant ultimately in God's eyes than than somebody that maybe have to clean a bathroom, right? You need to do that for the glory of God. You're not working for, you know, what, like we've got, we've got bathrooms. We have custodians. They work. You're not working for the church. You're not working for some, some manager that, who may be awful. You're not working for them. You're working for God. And so you need to remember to bring God glory in all that you do. You can bring glory in cleaning that bathroom. If it's the cleanest thing you've ever seen, people are going to come in and appreciate that. I don't know. A lot of people appreciate clean bathrooms, public bathrooms. And and you need to understand that that's actually an opportunity for you to worship and obey God. And I think that's too often we get stuck on what I said before, the identity issues. People thinking, oh, well, my job's less important than somebody else's job. That's not the case. Everything is important because we are working uh, for God. We are working to bring him glory. So um, let me see if I had anything I wanted to say to wrap up. And I am on time. I can't believe this. Um, yeah, so the, the, those are some of the truths I just want you to, to remember, that nothing you do is insignificant. Everything you're going to be doing should be for his glory. Um, and I, I think that first truth about God being the point is the one that's going to have the biggest impact. I think as you, as you come, you know, whenever you've been frustrated in life, or whenever you've been angry because your brother took something from you, your sibling, whatever, um, it's because you've put yourself at the center of the universe. I have this issue when I drive all the time. I, uh, I, it's really bad. It's like the one... So one thing that gets me all the time is I, I, I get angry at people that don't know how to drive. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's a cliche. I, I understand that. A lot of people probably come up here and, and say that all the time. But it really is me putting myself at the center of the universe and, and not taking the time to be patient to recognize that I need to, to honor him even with that. All right. So I think I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, as I said, each of these points, I, I want you to realize there's a lot of significance to them. And you need to understand being created in God's image is, is important. Being um, that we're, the fact that we're fallen, the fact that uh, sin has is, is corrupted us completely um, is important because it's going to help you explain that I need a Savior, that I need God's grace. Uh, and when you understand that Jesus came and took care of that for you, your response to God's grace will be one of worship, one of praise, and one of bringing him glory. So let me pray, and then I think David's going to come up and we're going to sing another song um, about God to worship him because he is the point. So God in heaven, I do thank you so much for being God, for, for being the one that's in control. Um, I just pray that you'd help us to realize that. Help us to believe that. Help us to remember that you exist, that, that you are good. Um, I pray too that you'd help us to see our, our, our nature as being fallen, um, to come to grips with the reality of that, to, to not pretend like we are better than we are, but to really own our wickedness, to own the fact that we don't desire you, that we don't truly want to worship you, that we actually do want to fight you. 
pray that you'd help us realize that only because when we do, we can experience your grace fully. Experience the grace that comes free uh, to us, that comes by a deep, um, significant payment by Jesus who took it on for us, whose righteousness has has now been accredited to our accounts and because of which we are now right before you. I pray that that grace becomes so real in our lives that it transforms in every aspect of our life, that, that we work now for your glory to worship you. God, I thank you so much for how you love us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.